<laughs> Hello, I'm Luther Kruger with the Big Blue Sun Museum of Solar Cooking from Minneapolis. Today I'm being hosted by Craig Berglund in beautiful Reno, Nevada. Beautiful sunny day, perfect day to talk about solar energy, solar cooking. And uh, the thing I appreciate about Craig is I can't think of anything solar that Craig hasn't tapped into somehow. Solar drying, solar distilling. So solar cooking solar panels uh, and we're going to take a tour later and do two segments on as much as we can fit in uh, but I want to definitely start off by having Craig talk about himself how did he get started in, in all this how did this come about uh, this it's like a menagerie like a art park <laughs> of uh, solar energy items so uh, Craig tell me how did you get started what how did you discover solar energy solar cooking etc uh, Living here in sunny Reno, it's hard uh, not to use the sun because we get so many days of sunny year, it's unbelievable, uh, as opposed to rain, and, and it hasn't rained here for several months. Uh, a lot of people who don't live in the high desert aren't aware that you can actually have days without rain. So we have a lot of sun here, and uh, we're uh, probably in the top 10 in the United States for sun energy, available sun energy, because of our uh, 4,500 foot altitude. Uh, the atmosphere is less dense. There's more sun energy coming through. And we have to realize that the sun is responsible for 99 to 100% of our available energy. Uh, one of the great uses of sun is photosynthesis. Probably the easiest uh, way of using the sun is uh, uh, burning biomass or, or uh, turning it into thermophilic uh, energy. We'll talk about that later. So uh, I just started playing with the sun, oh, probably in the mid-70s, uh, about the time the whole catalog came out. And uh, my favorite book is Direct Use of the Sun's Energy by Farrington Daniels. You can look it up. It's a wonderful book. I think you can still get copies of it. And uh, again, I'll repeat that uh, a, a square yard of sunlight is the equivalent of almost one horsepower of heat energy uh, that can be gathered under ideal locations. I've heard of people uh, solar cooking in the Arctic, Antarctica, one of the coldest spots on Earth. So the sun energy is free and we have to stop using fossil fuels. And uh, solar energy, not only thermos solar, but solar photovoltaic as the uh, is uh, pretty good. I'm a firm believer in uh, peak oil and, and uh, collapse scenarios. They don't all have to be ugly. They can be thought out and pre-planned. So it's like somebody puts up a rooftop of solar panels so the thing feel good about uh, drying their clothes in an electric car. And we've got a $30 clothesline in the backyard that we can use. I so I, I have a lot of interest in the sun. I like being outside. I don't like being in houses and confined. I spend most of my time out here playing with my lawn. So the idea is that you can make a lot of things to sustain civilization on inexpensive stuff. Glass bottles, for example. Here's a nice glass bottle. It's a Coors beer bottle. It's a quart. It's, it's amber. It's clean, it's sterilizable, uh, and most people buy these and drink their beer and, and throw them away. Well, if you take a little bit of care and you take off the label and clean it all down, you've got a wonderful uh, absorber. Now, uh, personally, I hate beer. I only drink beer because of these bottles, okay? So I'm doing this for science, uh, you might say. But there's a lot of things that are existing in the waste stream that we can utilize. I mean, this bottle, if it doesn't get broken, can last hundreds of years and reusable. You can fill it with water, set it in the sun, and uh, 
in an afternoon, it's going to get hot. You wash your hands with it. If you put a mirror behind it, it's going to get hotter. If you put two mirrors behind that, it'll get even hotter. If you put a clear cover over it, you can get it to boiling in about under three hours. Just set it in the sunlight. So, uh, rather than use electric and burn coal to heat water, to spin a turbine, to send electric miles away and lose efficiency so that you can run it into your hot water and get hot water. I mean, it makes more sense just to do it at the source. Yeah. The sun is free. Nobody's going to turn it off. It's going to go on and on for years and years and millennia. And to not use it as being silly. Yeah. I look at it in Minnesota. If it's a sunny day and I'm at my workspace, I feel like I'm wasting energy because I could be cooking with it. And um, here we have sun most every day, so yeah. it's silly to not take advantage of it. Yeah. So well, we're going to take a tour here in a little while, and I'm building a, a solar fence on the north here. I'll explain that what this all is. This is my solar kitchen that I'm working on. Uh, I like to build stuff. Sure. I like to experiment and play. Yeah. So. You know, about beer. I drink beer, oh. and I'm going to donate my body to science. <laughs> so I am drinking beer for science. <laughs> Very good. Well, this is great. I, uh, uh, I'm just so looking forward to doing the individual snapshots. I already got a tour from Craig, just general overview. But that was like just whetting my appetite to learn more. Uh -huh. so, so we'll, uh, yeah, there we go. Just so you know, it is really us. <laughs> okay. Well, we will uh, start the tour in a little bit and move our cameras around and you'll see what we're talking about. Okay, this is a little trailer I got from Harbor Freight. A couple hundred dollars. I put it together. It's uh, easy to tow even behind a small compact car. It's got a, I got a little hitch on my car, so if I want to boogie, I can hook it up and go. Uh, this is a 120 watt solar panel PV. Uh, I have it hooked directly up to a fan right here that's blowing. Uh, it will directly run a car automotive radiator fan, which is really good if you want to get into uh, evaporative cooling. And so in the afternoon I usually sit back there where the fan is and let it blow past me and spray a spritz bottle every once in a while if I want to cool off. Uh, this is a little array of solar heat tubes I've been working on. These are, uh, you're familiar with these tubes, of course, they're wonderful. They sit there and they get hot and uh, just remarkable things. The problem is it takes a lot to manufacture these things, so it's glass. Uh, it's liable to last a hundred years unless you break it. So this is one of those kind of set it and forget it things you can do. A lot of people will use uh, reflectors on these and get very hot temperatures very quickly. But I'm in no hurry. I'll just let the sun hit this thing and by afternoon uh, these are going to be mostly boiling. Here's uh, also they hold temperature really good up. Here we are. We're at 145 degrees already on this one. Uh, and it just not noon yet even and uh, this one I got some coffee going in I uh, filled it with clean water up to about there it's a 22 ounce uh, container I like to put about 16 ounces in it because stuff boils over as you probably noticed if you use these so to keep the heat in uh, I've taken these uh, beer cans again I hate beer you know I just drink it for science uh, you can cut them down, and you can, if you crimp them a little bit, they'll fit right on the top there. And if you drill a hole in it, then you can drop a little thermometer in and see what's going on. This whole unit actually does come out, so I can get the sun directly. And right behind you there, there's uh, two shiny, grab those two shiny guys. And this is a quick and easy way to add a little additional sunlight onto them. So eventually when I get this stationary, I'll probably mount these here so I can really get uh, get some heat going and maybe one or two up here on the top as long as it doesn't hit these panels. Uh, 
you probably noticed from using these that they tend to get scale on the insole. And as you use them, you know, stuff accumulates down there. So uh, I found uh, you can go to your local wine shop and, and get this stuff. It's called uh, Breweries. It's a non-caustic cleaner that will remove scale. I guess it's like CLR. So you can put uh, still white vinegar in here and let it uh, boil for a day and then uh, take it out and use it. I think I tried roasting some coffee beans in here at one time and they clump up at the bottom if you do it vertically. So if you're going to roast coffee beans, do it sideways. Shake it every once in a while so the beans don't clump up. And you can get some burnt beans really well. This is a tube that I have. Well, I won't take it off because we move that guy. Uh, this has calcium chloride in it. And calcium chloride is uh, commonly known as ice milk. Okay? It's a salt, and some people consider it as a sodium substitute for salt. So if you have high, uh, if you need a low sodium diet, you can, in theory, use calcium chloride, which is like sodium chloride, but calcium instead. Uh, the nice thing about calcium chloride is called an, uh, what's called an exothermic salt, which means when you get water in it, it generates heat. Put a bunch of calcium chloride in here, add some water if I wanted to heat something in the middle of winter without sunlight or whatever. In theory, I could do that. However, another use for calcium chloride is to make uh, activated charcoal. And you add it in a calcium chloride solution and you let it boil, then the calcium chloride uh, makes little microscopic holes in the carbon. And that's called activating it. So it, it makes a lot of receptors for to draw out poisons and toxins and stuff like that. If you're uh, purifying water after you disinfect it, you want to run it through activated charcoal to remove uh, minerals and stuff. Another salt called an endothermic salt is Epsom salt. So uh, if I wanted to cool something, I could fill it up with Epsom salt, add water, and it would drop quite a few degrees. I mean, uh, uh, this one here is making charcoal with, and these are uh, black locusts that I've had in for a day or two. You know, these will eventually maybe used for uh, drawing charcoal, whatever. But these heat tubes are spectacular for removing excess moisture. Okay. They will get hot, uh, blah, blah, but okay. you can distill anything as long as it's not ethanol in the United States. You cannot make your own moonshine legally, blah, 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 blah. But if suddenly there were a pandemic and hundreds of thousands of people died and uh, social order collapsed and you were stuck at home without power and whatever, blah. You should be able to distill your own alcohol. Grab your little spoon there and we're going to give you a taste of, this is mock distill, this is very strong, this is like 170 proof. And it's, it's a little, it doesn't, I'll make you a, a drink of it later if you want. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> now this is absent before it's distilled, and I just wanted to do this just to show you the difference in taste. And uh, oh yeah, you see the difference in what the distillation does. Yep. It completely removes most of the bitterness. So anyway, we're going to show you how a still works. We're going to pour this into this here. And we're going to put it on the still. Now that we have our absinthe bottle, this is a square foot solar cooker. It's made of three square foot mirrors. That's why I call it the square foot cooker. Or call it the FT2 cooker. This was a uh, the original this was called the uh, wine box solar rice cooker that I made back in 90, 1992, 93, 94, something like that. And you take a wine box and, a and you open it up and it used to have a mylar bladder. 
which is reflective. So I found out that you could glue that mylar bladder to the back of the wine box. And it had a thing here, like that. But I figure it's just as easy to make a square corner. Sure. Nice thing about this is you can do it with any cardboard box. You can line it with foil, glue the foil on it. So, so we're going to take this uh, mock absinthe here and we're going to distill it. So we got to get it heated up. First thing you do is you, you get yourself an outer covering jar. It, this is a number, number one PET plastic. It holds up very well to the sun. You can set that in here. And then we set our jar in here, found that what works even better, but not as quickly, is a nice glass jar, a gallon glass jar. Now when the casinos here were open, before the plague came, you could go into a, a, a bar in any casino and say, save me a gallon jar of maraschino cherries. When the cherries are all done, save me the glass jar. And they would do that. So now we have this in here. Next, we're going to have to cover it with a top. So you, you got to get yourself a new top. Uh, I find that you can drill through this with a number one with a one inch spade bit. Put it in a drill and drill right through the center. And what you're going to find is that the little quarter bottle fits perfectly over the jar. Okay. Now we're going to take this and we're going to drop it back in. And then we're going to take then we're going to take a piece of copper tubing that has corks on either end. And we're going to stuff it in one side. And on the back here, I have mounted a little collector bottle. This is for your distillate to come down in. And this just fits down into there. We're going to go and set this in the sun. In a couple hours, you're going to see uh, liquid dripping down into here. When it gets fully going, you get a drip about every three seconds. You're going to get a drip. And you should be able to catch this on camera because it looks kind of cool. And you'll also see the uh, water boiling in, inside here. It's kind of cool looking too. Now, it's very important to remember that you do it this way and not this way. <laughs> because if this tube sits down inside, it's going to heat up and it's going to pump all that into your jar. So make sure this is well above the level of your liquid. Okay. Now copper is kind of neat. They use it for distilling all the time. Uh, it gets a little worn and accumulates stuff from time to time, but you can clean this out with uh, white vinegar. Mm -hmm. You fill the tube with white vinegar and you let it sit for a while and then you can rinse it out. You can clean the outside too and, and let it rinse out. So that's a nice way to keep, your, keep it uh, kind of pure there. So we're going to go set this in the sun in a good location and then we'll come back and do sure. Cooker FT2 foot squared. Okay. And uh, this is an old one. A friend of mine made this for me. Collapsible. You can carry it around. It's a little bit heavy, so I don't really see why you would want to. <laughs> but you can throw it in the back of your car if you want to go out and go cooking. I like this because it's so easy to make. I really prefer glass as a reflective material over anything else because. It has wonderful reflectivity. It's it doesn't degrade. Uh, mylar will degrade after a while. Mylar scratches. Uh, you got to replace it every few years. Um, this these two uh, FT2 cookers have been sitting out for years now. These are probably eight, ten years old. If I'm energetic, I'll take a little uh, linseed oil and I'll cover the wood. But otherwise, I just leave them out. Notice they're slightly inclined this way. So mm. if it rains, the rain's going to come down and it's going to fall off, and it's not going to hurt the wood. Anyway, this is uh, 
This is a little bit overkill, but I, uh, if you take a nesting can, you can take the top off. I'm going to melt some beeswax here <laughs> because uh, I like it for sealing bottles better than regular a paraffin wax. And uh, I just set it on there. It's a little bit of paraffin. Old. I found out that you don't use a seamed can because no matter how good it is, the wax is going to get hot and it's going to leak all over. The whole idea behind solar cooking is you put it in the sun, it gets hot. You paint it black, it gets hotter. You put a mirror behind it, you're going to gain 20 degrees. Two mirrors, you're going to gain 40 degrees. Four mirrors, you're going to gain 60 degrees. And if you cover it with insulation, then you're really cooking. You can use glass, which I, I'm using for this. I'll show you how to work this still in a little while. Or you can use number one PET plastic, which is pretty durable stuff. Uh, this is just an old Costco container for biscotti or something. It's, it's sturdy, it's nice. You can see it started to deform a little bit as it, as it gets hot, but it was a freebie. And I'm not worried about off-gassing because anything you cook jar and jar has a lid on it. It's going to get hot. Any off-gassing is not going to go into your jar because your jar is expanding and it's going to escape. Sure. Uh, likewise, when it cools off at night, uh, the lid on your can is going to suck down and create a vacuum, so you're not going to have your off-gassing going in there, too. If you come right over from here with your little camera, sure. you can focus right on there. Right about from this area. Okay. You should be able to see the bubble in the back reflection. Oh, it'll, yeah, it'll catch it here, yeah. You see a bubble in there? Yeah. We'll get this and close in on it, too. And then, if you bring oh, yeah. it over to the side bottle, and you watch for about a couple of seconds. Oh, I've seen the drip already. Yeah, I saw a drop just as I just pulled over, but uh, there went one. Wasn't that one? We'll keep keep an eye peeled. And when it's going full, about every three seconds, you can get it. So this is about. I'm guessing 170 proof. Wow. We can go flame some. We'll show you how it <laughs> lights, but it's, you can't day. see it in the daytime. Sure. Because it's a blue flame. Yeah. That's the bad part. This is a bottle in jar, <laughs> under jar, still. And it works magnificently. Real simple. I love this thing. This is a. Uh, the distillate, it might have puked a little bit. Uh, lilac. Lilac. I think this is lilac. Sure. So you just take an old beer bottle and you scrape off the, the uh, label and you wash it real well. You stuff it with your material you're going to distill. You put it inside the other jar and then simply put the top on it. And we'll see in a little while, it's going to vaporize up here and it's going to start dripping down. The really nice thing about this is completely glass in glass, so you have no contamination from metals or, or anything else like that. It's all glass in glass. I love glass because it's sterile. Uh, below, is that is that just water? Is that already what's distilled? That, or what? That's a little bit, I think it boiled, over boiled, and some of the material came out. But it, it was water as of yesterday. And the, and the water was inside the beer bottle? or uh, The water was, yeah, this is, okay. this is how you start it is you put your material in and then you fill it with water. Ah, okay. So what you're actually doing is you're putting it in a blank jar. Oh my goodness. It's completely empty. This sure. is just filled up. This is the distillate. And like I say, it got hot and boiled, probably puked a little bit of the material. But this is the hydrosol. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is like an essential oil. Hydrosol sure. is, a, is a water based uh, distillate. Sure. Fragrances and, and things like that. There's probably a little bit of essential oil in here too. I would 
guess that somewhere in here there's going to be little droplets of essential oil if you wanted to collect those, but they're a kind of a pain. Speaking of steam, here's the little... Oh yes. I've got to turn this. You can see there's a little line here. And uh, can you see that yes. move, that line move? Yep. Yep. Okay. When it bisects, then, then you're it's in, in focus. focus. Okay. You know, every 20 minutes, you're going to want to move. Sure. It. So this is our distilled uh, lavender, lilac, lilac, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's been sitting on all afternoon. You see there's quite a bit of water oh, dripping yeah. out. There's already another maybe a quarter so inch or half inch. We've got quite a bit. I should have started fresh, but it was uh, temperature and it was cool anyway. Sure. Now, you, uh, you get a lot of heat coming out of the top. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of distilling is to have your container cool, which is why you see on the on the moonshiners, they run their stuff through water. Sure. They run their pipes through water to cool it. Well, this is air cooled. Sure. And we're using the sun instead of briquettes or whatever fires to, to make our hooch. So you don't really worry about efficiency because this is going to shine all day long. Mm -hmm. However, I found the other day. If you take a container of water and you set it on the top, uh. this is going to cool down the lid and it's going to increase the rate of condensation. In fact, I should probably put a full thing of water on it. But by putting this on top, this is going to slight, slightly sure. help this efficiency. Uh, another problem you have is while these jars are very well built and pretty close tolerances, there's still a little bit of slop in here. Sure. So one way to take care of that, and I haven't got any yet, is to get yourself some valve grinding compound that they mm. use for cars. It's mm -hmm. very gritty. And you can smear a layer on here, smear a layer on here, and then when you put the jars together, you can actually rotate it and make like a sealed Feel glass it. fit because sure. it will take off the imperfections sure. and it will get rid of all these little tiny air gaps in here that you're losing moisture through. So that's something you can do as you get into this more and you want to make it more efficient. But I'm not too worried about that because I set it here and I forget it. When I come back it's done. And of course, my very favorite is yes. the Sun Oven, the All American oh, Sun it's Oven. The, it's, it's the workhorse. It's a delight. Yeah. It's easy, it's trouble free, you really don't have to track. Yep. And I painted the outside black because the shiny was killing me. Yes. <laughs> all the time. So when it's closed, I got too much shiny around here, it gives me a headache. So. <laughs> and I did a little modification to this because. The glass is broken. Mm. I think somebody gave me to this. Somebody coming back from Burning Man, I think, at mm. one time said, you want this? The glass is broken. And they didn't want to fix it. They'd rather buy a new one. So I said, okay, and for $20, you can get a nice piece of tempered glass. I decided not to put the normal thing on because uh, this works quite well. Oh, yeah. If you just drop it down so, like this. It seals, the weight seals it up anyway. And so we're going to open this up. Yesterday I used this. I started losing the seasoning on my ah. my pan. So I oiled it and put it in yesterday and let it heat up. It's a good use if you're not using your oven for something. You can season your pans with it. I've got a chunk of uh, zinc in the bottom and a big chunk of iron in the uh, under that. So we're going to... Uh, Oh, also, if it gets, uh, if you get moisture in here, as you find when you do bread and stuff, it off gases sure. moisture. All you gotta do is turn this over. Oh, sure. <laughs> and uh, it'll it'll evaporate all that. Sure. So it's a kind of a cool modification. And we're gonna put in some uh, some stuff and just let it go. I'm really into uh, canning jars. Sure. This is my, my favorite kit here. This is a, a, a cup and a pint jar together. And you notice that uh, it doesn't rattle. It's, it's yep. all securely. 
So you have some kind of like gasket I or something on the bottom. The way to do this is you if you assemble it like this. Oh sure. It makes a complete kit. There's even room for a little spoon in there if you want to <laughs> put it in your backpack and with a uh, with a mylar solar cooker you can take sure. off. Uh, you can fill it and go just like that and let it sit. Uh, this one is is doing the same thing and we'll find that it's going to heat up pretty quickly through the day just sitting there without without any reflective. Um, so anyway I'm into canning jars because uh, you can use it to measure. It's perfect cup to here. There's a pint, two cups. Uh, you can store your stuff in it. You can cook in it. You can eat out of it. You can throw what's left in the fridge. <laughs> They're really versatile. Of course, I like to paint them flat black and I let them uh, sit for a day and roast in the oven and, and bake on them. So anyway, every couple days I come out and I make some uh, rice and lentils or uh, split peas. Today we're going to do some split peas. And one cup. This is a typical quart. So split peas, I've, uh, this will be the second time I made split peas. The first time I had the lid on securely and the pressure built up mm. and it's still going pssst. <laughs> and once it's pressurized like that, the pressure keeps up until all the liquid is gone. So I ended up with a very little bit of beans and a, a big mess in the solar mm. oven. So when, when you're cooking like this, don't tighten the lid down unless you're specifically trying to uh, um, pressure cook something. Sure. So I learned from that, always always leave it fairly loose. And about a, a split piece, uh, I'm going to use about a 3 to 1 ratio. And rather than measure, I know exactly how it goes. So we're going to just fill this up with water. About to there is good because everything's going to expand as it gets hot. The whole thing. You got the, the, with the steam. Yeah, the split peas are doing fine. Yep. The bread's starting to raise. I'm getting a little steam coming out of the rice. So the rice and beans are just about done. Sure. It's not going to hurt to leave them in. Mm-hmm. Because they're not going to lose a lot of moisture because the lid's on. Sure. So we can let them cook for a while, and I don't mind beans that are soft. Sure. It doesn't bother me at all. And you we'll move this just a little tiny bit. Yep. And you took care of the steam. And then by the time the sun clears, this will be well done. Sure. And you you took care of the steam problem by just not having the glass on a hinge. Right. You just you flip, flip it, it over. over, and all that moisture evaporates, yeah. and you can uh, recreate the front again. Sure. Uh, this is lithium batteries, and uh, you were talking about buying batteries eventually for your system. Sure. And the price is uh, very pricey. Well, yep. these are all from uh, phone modem, backup batteries, uh, uh, power tools, blowers, battery bowers, and things well, like that. These can all be salvaged, and sure. uh, you can get quite a lot of use out of them. A typical lithium cell will probably last you. 400 cycles hmm. used daily uh, and if you take care of it and don't overcharge it and don't undercharge it you might be able to double that I don't know you can sometimes get these from computer repair people and break them open and use the cells but you have to be very careful with lithium because if, uh, they can start fires if mm. it's overcharged if you don't fuse it right and things like that sure so this is a 3s system and, and when the Sun gets up I'll plug it in and show you how it works about 18 volts raw, 20 volts raw, but when you put it to a load, you're going to drop down to about 12 volts. So I've got it plugged in here to a little uh, solar modulator, a charge controller. This charge controller is, is hooked up to uh, three sets of lithium battery cells uh, for a total of cumulative total of about 12 volts, all three of them. Uh, when people build these, they they put them all in packs and they get 
uh, strips, nickel strips, and they spot weld them and they uh, and all this stuff and they it's kind of exotic and if a cell goes bad you got to disassemble your whole thing. Well these are in little pop out guys here. Instead of welding my uh, strips, my tin strips or what nickel strips, I just ran them along the back here. Here, 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 and here. And to join them together I, I use these little tiny auto fuses here. And you just plug it right in. And you can see over here, I don't know if you can see it, but it shows it should show 11.8 volts. Okay. And uh, these started at 11.2. They're already up 11.8. I'm going to let it go to about 12.1, 12.2 volts. Okay. And then I'll unplug my battery pack. And uh, it's just a different way of putting lithium together. Sure. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it works. <laughs> Jason, here's uh, the same thing for the, uh, the little gray packs that I showed you. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll get one, you get set up, and I'll bring it over here and show you. Okay. And this is kind of a kludge, but it works. My little 12-volt uh, pack slides in here. And I have an off switch, because you don't want to plug in the controller without the battery. In other words, you plug in your panel last after the battery. So we'll take this and I just run my two wires here. I plug in the green wire to ground. Oops. And the other wire to hot. And when it's in the sun, it's going to show me what the current voltage is. Right now I'm sitting at 11.0, 10.9 volts. 11.0. After it's uh, plugged in, then you just turn on your power switch to connect the panel to the batteries. And now we're up to 11.1 volts, 11.2 volts. And it's going to stay there. It's just going to keep charging until we get up to uh, nominal, which is uh, going to be 12.4. And then in theory it turns itself off. And then you take your battery pack out and you got it good for another couple of hours of use. This is a cheap old harbor crate cell. It's only 15 watts. So it takes uh, a few hours to charge up a 28 volt or 20 watt volt pack. But uh, when you're off grid, this is the kind of stuff you can use. You know, again, you can. You can scavenge old panels from roofs, figure out how to hook, hook them up to 12 volt car batteries, use the lights off of cars, use the fans, use whatever you want. You can drop your mask in there. Generally, you hang it. Okay, and I'll put it back on. So when you use wire, unlike glass, it allows the UVC light to get through without any interruption. So if you come home and you got you got some currency or a credit card or something, you can drop it in here and hopefully somebody doesn't come in your backyard and grab it. Uh, so I usually let it sit about 15 minutes or so out here in UV and uh, it gives me a feeling of confidence that it's been disinfected. Yeah. Now this is uh, a modification of my square foot solar cooker. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you cut off the sides, it looks like this. And come to find out, I posted this on one of the uh, uh, Facebook pages a while back and a woman uh, uh, wrote me and said that this was her design, and, and in fact, I looked it up and it is. Well, her name is uh, Sharon Cousins. Well, sure, sure, she's yeah. a reasonably famous uh, name in, yeah, she's been in solar well. design, yeah. and and this is her baby, so I yeah. want to make sure she has credit for this, but, sure. because it's a, a cute little guy. Yeah. 
but I decided to, before I got into that, I decided to make my square foot solar cooker here a little more flexible. And what that means is you move this, you move this, you move this. And you can actually gain somewhere there's little wires around here and you put a wire in here and a wire in here and you can adjust it. As you see the see the bright spots coming through sure. and you can actually by using three wires get maximum uh, oh there they are right like this. Sure. And they can go into any combination of those. You can go at any angle, angle you want. Keyboard. Yeah. Okay. And then it, it's much brighter here and then on the other side you just you get the idea. Sure, sure. You can do the same thing. So that was a, a modification of the square foot solar cooker uh, and more like Sharon's cooker there. But it's kind of a hybrid halfway. Sure. Okay. Uh, by doing tests between this and a regular square foot, this will get about 10 degrees hotter or faster. Well, because instead of this stuff being lost, it's being focused, as you can see here. Onto it. But the trade-off is here, it's more of a tracking device. Yeah. You've got to be on top of it. You've got to track it all the sure. time. So if you want something hotter, faster, you can go with this. Yeah. But I, I just, for myself, I like the ease and simplicity of it. Regular I built this stuff. one back in the probably mid to late 70s. Uh, it was an icosahedron and it had triangular sides coming down, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. sure. So it extended a little bit beyond the diameter was a little bit larger than this. Okay, and you can make this from a single sheet of coroplast. Oh yeah. There's the design. It doesn't have to have a hole in it, but I wanted a post so I could make it uh, sure. rotatable. And you make one cut here, and then you make slices halfway through on the rest of it, and you can achieve pretty much any focal length you want. Mm -hmm. by uh, simply maneuvering that. And I like it as, a, as about a five-sided here like this. And you can set your, set your stuff in there. Now, the one thing that I really like the potential about this is the fact that you could make it a trackable device. And I think you could probably do it pretty easily. If you imagine that, Okay, there's east, that's where the sun comes up. You had your little thing in here. And if I had uh, a water bottle attached to here with a hole in it, and I had another water bottle over here without a hole in it, as this bottle gets lighter, it's naturally going to pull this side down. Sure and it's going to continue to pull this side down. <laughs> so you see what we just got here is we are able to track from here to here to afternoon sun here with one device at, with a, a weight that would <laughs> actually move it. So rather than do this, sure. this is a, a kind, of, kind of a unique geometric design, I think, because it does that. Anyway, hopefully somebody watching this will play with this thing and figure it out and share with the rest of us. Sure. Because that's the whole idea of trying to do this. Anyway, that's my original solar curve. And again, the FD2 is probably my favorite solar cookie because you set it, forget it. You come back and get it ready. This is baking soda into washing soda. Okay? If you take like the other salt we talked about, you take regular baking soda and you heat it and drive out that extra uh, uh, water molecule, it changes acidity and it becomes washing soda. So you can use it as a washing powder, I guess. <laughs> so that's uh, an experiment with that.
Notice the Crooks radiometer? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about. Isn't that a wonderful little device? The Crooks a little device. The Crooks radiometer. <laughs> I doubt we could make one of those today. <laughs> and, uh, and what is it telling us? It's telling us that we have sunlight. Oh, yeah. And now we have shade. Uh, yes. And when you have full sunlight, it spins at full RPM. It's just a little thing they discovered in a vacuum with one side black and one side white. They're actually proving that the photons are pushing against the black surface. That they actually have mass, I guess, is what they proved. I'm not sure what it was. I'm not a scientist. All right, we're going to try solid roasting some coffee. Well, here's a little machine I put together. This is a uh, bunt cake pan covered with a screen. And on the back is a little 12 volt, 24 volt motor that drives everything. And there's a little battery that runs it. And when I hook up the battery, whoops, we lost the connection here. When I hook up the battery, Oh, there we go. Got a loose connection there. It'll actually rotate in the sun. Because when we put the parabolic on here, it's going to hit in this spot. And if we leave it there, it's going to burn all the beans. So what this does is this rolls the beans around. So let me turn it off here and we'll load it with coffee. Take my little screen back. And this is some Kenyan coffee I got in 2018. This is uh, green beans. And green beans will uh, last a lot longer than roasted coffee. Which is why good coffee people don't roast until they get the green beans. And then it's good. So what I did is I vacuum sealed this uh, jar so that the greens stay, stay bean. And we should hear a little air intake as I open it up. A little shoop. Got that. Hmm. So we'll load this up with beans. I made a little device that works off of the same batteries. There's a tiny little 12 volt pump here. You can use it either for pumping water or for uh, sucking air in or bubbling water if you want to. Uh, it runs on four little cells here. And it has a little on off switch. There you go. So, we take this little guy and we put it over our can. These are typical canning things you can buy. So what I do is I just put this down in here and... <laughs> and that's going to pump out all the air. So now I have a nice vacuum to get. So I put this away and my beans are going to stay fresh and not get oxidized on me. So now we'll take this over to the parabolic and we'll turn it on and hopefully everything's going to work. Okay, uh, this fits right in the center there. And I'm not going to focus it yet until we get that turning. Now, 
the rate of rotation determines the roast of the beans. If it rotates really quickly, it's going to take a long time for the beans to get consistent. But uh, So I have a little way here of turning on this motor so it goes either quickly. Okay, the battery's going directly into the motor here, so it's turning at, I don't know, whatever rate that is. If, it's, if the sun conditions are different and I want it to turn a little bit slower, then I run it through a little light bulb here. And that's going to provide some resistance and you can see how, how much slower it uh, lowered the RPMs. Also, I have a little pause button here so I can stop if I want to get a portion of the beans black. I also have a little reverse switch on here if I want it to turn the other way, depending on if the sun's over here or over here. So now we got it running. Let's uh, see if we can focus this darn thing. And right about... There. But if you can bring your camera over here, yeah. you can actually see it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh that's that's taking care of business. Now if I want to get some action going here, I just hit the little pause button. Oh yeah. And after a minute or so, you're gonna start to see the hot spot there. Oh, it's already you can you can tell. I there mean, that's beautiful because it's it's yeah it's hitting as almost as many as the beans that settle there. And obviously, as that spins, it turns them around. So there's others. Wow. And that's basically it. Now, the, uh, I'm not a professional bean roaster, but I understand there's two uh, things that happen is. Uh, they get to a certain point and they pop. It's called a crack. Okay, first crack is uh, not so well beans done, and second crack is like a darker roast, like the French mm -hmm. roast and things like that. So, as I play with this during the day, you can actually walk by it sometimes, and you can hear the beans crack at you. Yeah, let's see if we can get a little crack here. I used to have this hooked up to a direct solar panel and one day the sun went over the panel and turned off the motor and it burned a big hole Ooh. through my screen and so when you roast beans like this you got to pay attention to it because if the battery runs down you just wasted a half a pint of beans sure. blah blah. You know, let this run and we'll check back on it from time to time through the day. Sure. It's kind of a pain in the butt because you got to be out here all day making sure it's right and you get hot. And I could tell you Stan Wells this will be one of his next projects yeah. <laughs> because, and he'll do it all with the panels. It'll just be the little panels you can get, you basically cannibalize them from yard lights. Oh yeah, yeah. For instance, I'll bet you he could oh, do that. sweet. Yeah, you know, and then, uh, and then, and he'd be able to set it on a tracker so it could stay in focus. The that would do it all. That yeah. would be so sweet. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you hear that, Stan? <laughs> Check back on this in a little while as the sun moves. And again, it's going to go this direction. Mm -hmm. The beam is going to go that way. So. so when you had a solar panel, that took care of every, it. Took care of everything because that was the power rather than the battery. Yeah, it was power for that. Uh, so everything else is the same. It was just the yeah, power. everything's yeah. the same. Yeah. Sure. So uh, instead of using batteries, you just use the panel. Sure. But these are so easy because a single volt, a single cell at 3.7 volts, 4 volts, mm -hmm. will run this 24 volt motor at this speed. Oh, sure. So you don't have to worry and about... And it will do it for up quite a few hours. You don't have to gear it down. And when I just swap batteries, yep. if it goes down on me. Sure. I could actually put two of them in uh, parallel here to get sliced, uh, but I just have it... Oh, I did design it in. By God, oh. there is room for two there. So, one here and then one goes right oh, here. Sure. 
so if it starts going out later and we smell the beans burning from 500 yards away then I'll just slap another battery yeah. in and we'll let it go again. I wonder if you can do the same thing with barley for malted barley can you do chocolate barley what do they call it? You probably could that's why I like barley as a crop because you can make sugars out of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, very easily. Uh, I've done cacao mm. in here, but it's kind of hard because once the basket is used to coffee, it accumulates the oh, coffee sure, of sure. patina. Sure. So I'd have to get another basket. And but I did sure. try this in a glass jar at one time, but no, 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 no. Uh -huh. Shattered. It goes shattered. So anyway, we, when you get a rust with different shades of bean darkness, I think it gives you a broader spectrum of the actual taste of the bean. Sure. Okay, and our coffee's getting a little darker, but uh, I let it get out of focus while we were chatting, so this will probably take another day. And the interesting thing about this is some of the beans get blacker, some of them get lighter, but I call it a an ahomogenous mix. Sure. Okay. Some people roast the beans to a certain darkness, but they lose the colors, the flavor notes of the other roast too. So by doing this, getting an ahomogenous mix, you're getting a little bit of the dark roast taste, the mid roast taste, the city. Uh, range taste, the, the ultra light taste. So it's kind of, it makes for an interesting coffee. And sure. I still don't know quite how to make a good blend yet. But that's experimenting. <laughs> Come on, baby. Show me your stuff. All right. <laughs> 